The IMF's managing director discusses the global economy in a one-on-one -on -one interview. What does she see ahead for 2021 and beyond? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are about to hold their major spring meetings. And in a curtain raiser address ahead of the gathering, the IMF's managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, laid out her expectations for the global economy for 2021 and 2022. She sat down with me afterwards for an in-depth discussion that also focused on China and the IMF's role in Africa. Kristalina Georgieva, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Before we get into the specifics, what is your outlook for the global economy in 2021 and 2022? Uh, will we see uh, better growth uh, than many believe, or is there still a risk that things could get worse? We are projecting the world economy to be on a firmer footing. We will be upgrading our growth projections for 2021 and 22, uh, and it is on the grounds of two very important factors. One is vaccinations accelerating, and two, the massive policy support that has been provided most recently in the United States. But this is a multi-speed recovery. There is a dangerous divergence of fortunes within countries and across countries. Just to give you one example, we project advanced economies to still have income per capita below 2019 of 11%, although a couple of countries will reach their pre-2019 level by the end of this year. But more troubling, low-income countries, middle-income countries, are going to sustain 20 percent below 2019 income level all the way until the end of next year when we take uh, china out of this group what it means is that we have to concentrate on what are the drivers to accelerate progress everywhere and number one among them is access to vaccines you mentioned policy support from the United States. Well, the U.S. Congress here has just passed the $1.9 trillion stimulus package. It's been signed into law by President Joseph Biden. Uh, how much of an impact will that have? Uh, we calculate that the impact of this package over uh, three years will be 5 to 6 percent boost to U.S. growth. And uh, it would be also reflected in our upgraded projections for global growth because of the positive spillover it has through trade on many other countries. Uh, there are some concerns would that uh, package uh, uh, push up inflation. Uh, our estimates are that inflation in 2022 would be two and a quarter percent. In other words, we don't see this to be a, a danger where we are warning that the tension has to go is if there is a rapid growth in the United States that leads to rise of interest rates, that might be a problem for economies that have significant levels of debt and high borrowing uh, requirements. So what we are grateful to see is uh, Chairman Power in the United States providing very clear forward guidance in that regard. Uh, and at the same time, we would be urging countries to, to pay attention, to be vigilant and be prepared for when especially policy support gradually is withdrawn. You pull back a support, but scale up social protection at that time to workers and then make sure that firms that are viable are supported to keep the economy going, to keep the recovery up 
and forward. Well, let's talk about the world's other major economy, and that is China's economy. China has done very well in recovering from the COVID pandemic. It's predicting uh, growth uh, of 6% plus uh, for 2021. How important will China's economic performance be uh, in helping the rest of the world recover? It is the other big engine of the world economy. Uh, we will be also upgrading our projections for, uh, for China. Uh, and it is a country that plays a significant role uh, in terms of generating growth elsewhere uh, through two channels. One is uh, demand for imports. Uh, we have seen a uh, recovery in uh, commodities partially driven by the manufacturing uh, recovery, especially in China and also elsewhere. And uh, uh, secondly, by having uh, the uh, Chinese own recovery uh, gradually moving also towards uh, more domestic demand, boost of consumer uh, confidence uh, at home. So as their recovery uh, balances up uh, more in that sense, so it is less depend dependent on uh, stimulus and more dependent on domestic uh, consumption, it would be also a more durable and sustained uh, recovery. How concerned are you about low-income countries? I'm thinking of countries especially in sub-Saharan Africa where they have limited resources. Uh, the IMF, for instance, would like to see something like a $650 billion SDR allocation, that's special drawing rights allocation. How would this kind of funding help those countries? We are very concerned about low-income countries. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, they're getting the short end of the stick in multiple ways. Uh, vaccinations are not uh, yet reaching at any reasonable scale these countries. Uh, they have been very hard hit uh, by the uh, uh, recession in the rest of the world, especially those of them dependent on the rest of the world doing well, tourism-dependent economies. For quite some time, uh, commodity-dependent economies suffered uh, quite a lot. But on top of it, they have very limited fiscal space to respond. Just to give you the dramatic numbers, Fiscal support in advanced economies equals 24% of their GDP. In emerging markets, 6%. In low-income countries, 2% of a much smaller uh, GDP. And this is why at the IMF, we have been working hard to increase our contribution to the recovery of uh, these uh, countries both by increasing significantly concessional finance. Uh, just to give you an example, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have provided 13 times more last year than we would do in an average year in terms of lending. But also to seek the uh, collective to step up because a, uh, a new allocation of special drawing rights means exactly that, using the strength of our 190 members to build better buffers, stronger reserves, especially in the low-income uh, countries. Uh, our discussion at our uh, spring meetings is going to be all about a fair shot. Fair shot in people's arms, but also a fair shot to vulnerable people and vulnerable countries to better opportunities and a better future. China is already heavily involved in uh, Africa's economy, and, and it's also been providing aid to help countries in Africa recover from the pandemic. Uh, what kind of role do you see China playing in Africa's economic recovery? Uh, China has been very engaged in the context of the uh, G20 to take one particular action that we strongly support, and it is to provide debt relief to countries that are with so much to wrestle with and such a limited capacity to do so. Uh, China participates in the uh, uh, initiative to freeze 
repayments, the debt service suspension initiative. It has allowed last year over $5 billion to stay in the hands of countries uh, rather than be paid as debt service, and, and China was a big part of that. But they also are now part of the uh, common framework for debt resolution that allows to go one step further for countries where debt is not sustainable to bring that debt down uh, through a uh, debt reduction. Uh, in addition to that, uh, China has been uh, also uh, providing support in terms of health and in terms of economic uh, um, um, boosters, including through the IMF. China has on landed through the IMF $1 billion equivalent of special drawing rights. So we can do more for these countries at the time they need us the most. They also contributed to our own debt relief for our poorest uh, members. Of course, countries welcome aid, but uh, some countries have expressed concern over the kinds of conditions that, uh, is, uh, or that are attached to the kind of aid that they get. We recall in the global financial crisis of 2008, just after that, uh, some countries received a bailout, but they were forced to implement very severe austerity measures. I'm thinking of Greece in particular. Can the IMF help countries in Africa without burdening them with crippling debt and austerity? We have done exactly uh, this in this crisis. Uh, we have provided massive emergency financing with very uh, concessional terms with only two conditions. One, please help your doctors and your nurses, your most vulnerable people, your most vulnerable parts of the economy. And second, Please do that transparently. Keep the receipts so we can see what money has done to help fight COVID, the health crisis, but also the economic uh, crisis. And that injection of emergency financing uh, played a very important role so that these countries can sustain their economies and provide uh, help to their people. Going forward, we are discussing with countries uh, programs that would have uh, conditions oriented towards helping them make the transition to digital, climate resilient, inclusive development. And we hope that by doing that support for their recovery, we will reduce this dangerous divergence that I spoke about. You know, you talked a moment ago about giving countries a fair shot, and we know there has been pretty deep concern about the availability and distribution of vaccines in developing countries. Um, I mean, I know for one that China has been distributing vaccines in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but, you know, that hasn't been matched by similar distribution from other countries around the world. What is the IMF view on this issue, seeing that it's so closely connected to economic recovery? Uh, our message is very simple. In uh, 2021, probably also in 2022, vaccine policy is the most important economic policy. It is not only hugely important because we are talking about lives of people. It is hugely important because without it, we cannot achieve a sustainable recovery. Uh, our assessment shows that acting together and rapidly to accel accelerate vaccinations can boost growth this year by one percentage point. And if you do so, then revenues from taxes would go up. Countries globally can get a, billion, a trillion or more of additional tax revenues. What it means is that the most effective use of public money today is for vaccinations. Uh, and I'm very um, encouraged to see that more and more attention is being paid exactly on that equitable 
and rapid access to vaccinations. Uh, obviously, the economic benefits uh, are clear, but also we cannot beat the pandemic anywhere without defeating it everywhere. And we have seen mutations sending a strong signal in that regard. Uh, one final question, very briefly, ma'am. Uh, you have pointed out that there is a new momentum towards uh, greener, smarter economies. Uh, how much of a green infra infrastructure push would you like to see? Uh, what we want to see is that the next round of support uh, from governments uh, as uh, they steer the way uh, through this crisis uh, uh, is directed to green and di digital investments. Uh, our analysis shows that uh, uh, a green investment push can lift up growth by 0.7% over the next uh, 15 years and create millions of green jobs. What we are advocating for is for governments to look at the triage of making sure that carbon has a price and it is predictable over lo long term so producers and consumers can take that signal that the governments are pushing for green infrastructure to accelerate the transition to the new climate economy but also that attention is paid to communities and also countries that may be negatively impacted because they are in the uh, high carbon intensity sectors uh, of the economy and that there is a fair transition. So when we talk about green investment push, we stress it has to be part of that uh, overall strategy very encouraging to see so many countries coming up with their uh, net carbon targets by by in china by 2060 uh, in many other uh, more advanced economies by 2050 to get there we have to start now not wait kristalina okay. georgieva thanks for joining us thank you now, for reaction to what the IMF Managing Director has been talking about, I'm joined from Portland, Oregon, by Yan Liang. She is a professor of economics at Willamette University. And joining us, too, via Skype from Washington, D.C., is Abdullahi Boru Halaki. He is an African security and policy analyst. Welcome to both of you. Yan Liang, let me start with you. We just heard the Managing Director of the IMF tell us there that uh, the organization will be upgrading its economic projections for China. There's expected to be... Uh, more imports as well as greater consumer demand. How is China's economy doing and what kind of impact will a growing Chinese economy have on the global economy? Well, I think, you know, from the first quarter, um, because China grew from such a low base in 2020, um, it, would be, uh, it won't be surprising if China grow at a 20 percent um, year on year for the first quarter. Um, we have seen the updated the PMI data where service sector really bounced back very strong. So I think uh, for most of the estimates, China will be grow to close to 8 percent, if not double digit growth um, for this year. And I agree with the IMF director, a strong economic recovery in China is going to be very conducive for the global recovery. And I would, I would say it's not only from trade and imports, but also from many other aspects. For example, China is ramping up with the vaccine production and it estimate to produce 2.6 billion doses. And it has donated many vaccines to over 50 countries in the world. So that would really help to put the pandemic under control. In addition, China has been a uh, major global investor. Um, its BRI project, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, has 2,600 projects um, with about $3.7 trillion um, worth of investment. Now, the pandemic has slowed down some of the investments, but China has been uh, doubling down on energy and um, digital infrastructure. So I think both the quantity and quality of China's investment is going to help uh, with the rest of the world. Um, in addition, China has been you know, a major lender, uh, a major foreign aid contributor. Um, so I think for many aspects, China is going to um, you know, help the global economy to recover. 
Abdullahi, we heard these very positive sentiments expressed by the IMF managing director talking about the world economy being on a firmer footing for this year and for next year. But she also had a warning. She talked about the danger of what she said, she termed it a dangerous divergence, where uh, lower income and middle income countries will struggle while the more advanced economies will be doing a lot better. Uh, when it comes to lower income countries, middle income countries, how much does that hold true for the countries of Africa? It is going to be incredibly difficult. I mean, like what I want to emphasize is even before COVID, majority, uh, no, enough number of African economies were already reeling and, um, you know, the odious debts that they have taken. And once that combined with COVID and um, it made everything incredibly very difficult, there are projections that African uh, countries, uh, you know, but two decades now could actually go into a recession. And added to that is the fact that for most of the African countries, one of their biggest traders was China. Once Chinese economy started cooling a little bit, that had a multiple impact on majority of African countries, where quite a huge number of them rely on exporting to China a lot of raw materials, particularly um, that, are, that, that are related to hydrocarbons. And so that will be very, very difficult. But what I really wanted to get into is how the failure to vaccinate, you know, in most of the African countries, that would make the situation fairly difficult. Uh, if you look at the COVAX um, uh, facility that is being used for vaccination, um, the, the total that was put aside was 600 million uh, for African countries. That is close to 20% of African countries. So far, only 20 million of those vaccines have been released to African countries where, you know, in most of the developed countries, uh, they have, you know, double or triple the number of vaccines that they require. Um, for instance, Astro, um, AstraZeneca, uh, the prices in, in, you know, in EU countries is something like 2.15 per uh, dollar per shot. In African countries, it's 5.25 US dollars. So all those things, you know, vaccine nationalism and economy not doing very well when combined would, you know, make this year very difficult economically for African countries. Yes, that's right. In fact, the IMF managing director did talk about that, linking the distribution and availability of vaccines to economic growth. Uh, Yang Liang, one of the other things we talked about was the $1.9 trillion economic stimulus package, which was passed here by the United States Congress. Uh, the IMF thinks that it will boost growth, uh, it will be good for the economy, and it will possibly have a ripple effect on the world economy. But uh, uh, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva, she also warned of the danger of rising interest rates. Um, what kind of impact do you think this stimulus package will have? Well, I think the stimulus package will be very important, um, not only to bolster the U.S. economy in the short run, but really build the U.S. At a, on a more sustainable path going forward. And I don't worry about the interest rate whatsoever. Um, I think, you know, Jerome Powell has talked about this very clearly, that interest rate will not be increased until 2023. And I believe the Federal Reserve has very large control on that interest rate. I don't believe this sort of fiscal crowding out effect where, you know, when the government spends more, um, then the interest rate will be somehow magically uh, raised. I think the Fed has large control um, on the interest rate. And I believe that, you know, the United States is um, moving to the right direction. And I also wanted to add that, you know, China has been doing this all along, um, where it has invested uh, about 1.4 uh, trillion dollars in the next six years on, you know, infrastructure, including, you know, 5G, high-speed rail, um, data centers, AI, etc. And also the local governments, 23 provinces, are also investing heavily in infrastructure on the order about, you know, $6.5 trillion. Uh, so I think um, both countries will um, be, um, you know, uh, rekindling the economy by these kinds of fiscal stimulus. And I think it's uh, too premature to think about monetary tightening. Um, but yes, managing debt would be important uh, for both countries as well. Abdullahi, there has been some criticism which has been leveled at the IMF for the conditions that they attach to loans. And they also call for very 
uh, serious, severe austerity measures at times. Uh, but in that conversation I had with the IMF managing director, she said that, look, the IMF has provided emergency funding for countries in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, uh, with very few conditions attached to them. How can the IMF help these countries? I think one of the most important ways that IMF can do is not to attach those stringent measures. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, these are spoken in very esoteric terms, but, you know, the scars of, you know, IMF and World Bank austerity measures uh, in the early 90s uh, are still very much with us. Um, so we, we see social services that have been cut for a very long time. So if in the midst of serious economic uh, problems that African countries are experiencing, IMF moves in and, you know, prescribe these straight jacketed uh, austerity measures, you will see serious cut in social services and the state being retrenched when the economy is in, in a fairly precarious situation. For most countries, that will spell um, serious challenges. So for IMF, I think they need to be, you know, very even-handed, which would be, um, you know, the distance between rhetoric and action will be, will be very much tested. It's one thing to say that, no, we, we don't, we don't impose conditions, but it's quite another when they move in and say you have to cut social services, you have to retrench your civil servants. Um, all those things uh, will have um, a very severe impact, and we are still paying the price of the structural adjustment programs that were instituted by the IMF and the World Bank. Yang Liang, on that question of debt relief, uh, China has in some instances been freezing repayments uh, from some countries. Uh, how significant is that in helping poorer countries uh, manage their debt burden? Right. I think it's very important. Um, the, you know, China is part of the G20's um, you know, debt service suspension initiative. And China alone uh, contributed to you know, $2.1 billion of you know, debt service suspension. And I think this is very important in the sense that a lot of the poor countries, they are borrowing foreign currencies. Uh, to support their domestic fiscal uh, uh, spending. So it's important for these countries to allow, uh, to, to be allowed um, not to pay back the debt, but rather use the scarce resources um, to really for their domestic initiatives. Like um, the IMF has estimated that these countries are going to spend hundreds of billion dollars in, uh, in the next decades just to fight the pandemic and to boost economic recovery. So it's very important to um, give these countries debt relief to allow for them to have this breathing room. I want to go back to quickly my previous comment about debt management, you know, in China and the U.S. Um, I don't think it's the public debt that really um, concerns um, these countries. It's more of the private debt. So um, it's the corporate debt, it's the household debt that need to be managed. And the public debt, as long as the government is spending their own sovereign currency, I don't think they have any problems um, like the private sector might have. So I think it's important for um, countries like China and the United States um, to not only increase fiscal stimulus at home, but um, help these other uh, heavily indebted poor countries to keep their resources for the domestic um, spending. Yang Liang, Abdullahi Boru Halaki, thanks to both of you for joining us. And we need to leave it there. Thanks for joining us on another edition of The Heat.